Okay, so we have a handful of questions here from Laura. Um, but if anyone else has any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat and I will read them out. Courtney says, awesome presentation. Thank you, Courtney. Um, so Laura would like to know, what was it like in space? So uh, being in space is a pretty neat experience, although it's not something you can really prepare for tremendously. Um, imagine the launch process. You are sitting on the pad, so you can kind of imagine that by taking a chair and leaning it back on the floor, and that's your sitting on the pad in 1G. And then to simulate the launch, have two of your friends who weigh about what you do jump on your chest because that simulates three Gs. That's what it feels like when the engines are pushing. So you've got that force on your chest pushing down. And all of a sudden, when you get to main engine cutoff, which is called Miko, the shuttle engine shut off. And just like that, you're floating. Your body has been kind of compressed. It expands like a spring. You move forward. You turn your head and your inner ear is going, hey, when you turn your head, I'm supposed to get signals to understand how to hold your head up but I'm not getting those. And it's like, whoa, this is crazy. So it's really disorienting at first, uh, but your brain is incredible. It kind of rewires itself in a couple of hours. And before you know it, you're floating on the ceiling, turning your head around and doing all these things uh, like you've lived there your whole life until you come back down to the ground and land. And now gravity reinserts itself on your ears and you turn your head and <laughs> It goes, whoa, again, you know, Ugh. so uh, I would not turn my head like this uh, after we landed. It was very, very uh, uh, inducing of vertigo, you know, feeling like you'd fall down. But being, once you're accustomed to space and you can float, it's awesome. You use your hands a lot to pull around and you realize you just have to gently push on things. It doesn't take a lot of force. As a matter of fact, you start holding on to things. You say, okay, I don't want to go anywhere. And you kind of fight with yourself until you learn to just kind of relax and just a little gentle pressure will hold you right where you need to be. Um, was it cold in space? So space is cold and hot. It depends on uh, where the sun is, if it's radiating to you. Uh, it's about 200 degrees below zero in the payload bay when you're in the shade and about 200 degrees hot when you're in direct sunlight. Now, the big thing is in on orbit, you know, there's not an atmosphere, so there's nothing to conduct the heat, but the sunshine on the spacesuit or the sunshine on the vehicle heats it up. And we have, when you open the payload bay doors, those are actually radiators that we use to cool all our equipment inside and uh, keep the air cooled as well. Um, so when, when you were on your missions, the things that you did in space, you had mentioned um, ex like some experiments and things like that, and also servicing the telescope. But can you tell us some other things that you did while you were there? So the first mission, Neuralab, um, I was in charge of the crickets. We had 1,500 crickets on board, and uh, every other day, I just had to open the uh, container they were in, film them in there, and then close it. So it was not a demanding science task, which uh, because I was the pilot, and we had all these uh, medical doctors and a veterinarian on board that they could trust the pilot with. Uh, so that was one of the things. I also was in charge of the photo TV system. So anytime we did a downlink, a video, I had to set that up. I used the cameras to take pictures of people doing the experiments uh, while we were on orbit. And then as the pilot, I was the backup to the commander for operating the space shuttle. And there's a lot of overhead in keeping the shuttle going. You have to change out the LIO canisters that remove the carbon dioxide. While you're on orbit, you have to monitor the water system your um, fuel cells actually create water. And if you're not using all of it, you have to dump it before the tanks get too full. And uh, 
just a lot of housekeeping, I guess I'd call it, you end up having to do as the uh, pilot. And uh, actually one of the, the less uh, glamorous jobs was that the, uh, the pilot was in charge of keeping the waste uh, collection system, the WCS in good shape, making sure everybody who used the toilet left it in good shape and, uh, and kept it clean. So fun times, that was uh, that mission. The second mission went to the International Space Station. And there we kind of were the Finnish carpenters getting the house ready for people to move in. Uh, we took off the launch restraints that were, had, were attached to the different uh, vehicles. We uh, ran the lighting, got it all set up. I actually installed the toilet again, <laughs> I put a toilet. So I actually got a little note from the uh, plumbers union in my hometown giving me a special dispensation to work on toilets. Uh, and then uh, on my last two missions, working on the Hubble Space Telescope, the first one, we actually replaced the solar arrays, the panels that give the telescope power. And then we went in and we took the power control unit apart and replaced it, which was basically like heart surgery on uh, the Hubble. The part that kept everything going, we had it completely shut down for the first time ever, put in this new power control unit and then powered it back up and held our breath to make sure it came back on because that sometimes happens when you shut something off that's been on for you know 16 years, I think at the time. And then uh, on the last mission, we uh, actually, as I, I meant to show in that one video, we did more heart surgery, I'm, I'm sorry, brain surgery here. We took boxes that were in the vehicle, took a panel off of them, pulled parts out, put parts in, repaired things, and uh, really just elevated the repair from being a box in to a box out to something where it was co specific card dependent stuff that was really probably the most intricate spacewalks that have ever been done. Someone wonders if you met Wally. Now, I don't think you met Wally, but I'm wondering if you if you used uh, robotics in any of your missions. So the Hubble repair, actually, uh, the mission I, the last mission I flew, had actually been canceled by NASA after the Columbia accident, saying that it was too risky for astronauts to go to Hubble. So they spent an awful lot of time working on a robotic repair mission to be able to send a robotic spacecraft to Hubble to try and do some of the repairs that were needed, like replacing the gyros. In the end, they decided that wasn't feasible, that we just didn't have the robotic technology yet to be able to do the intricate kind of repairs that we did. And even with humans in the loop, we ran into problems when we were working on the telescope where uh, things didn't go right. And we went through all our contingency procedures and we had to think of something completely different to get the job done. And I just think there's no way a robotic effort could have overcome all the obstacles we ran into. So I like the idea of robotic missions. I think they're a great aid to extend human capability, but they're not a replacement for human ingenuity either. Uh, Garrison asks, um, he saw images of the Hubble telescope and slides, and he has heard that there was a Hubble image with a galaxy that is 13.8 billion light years away. Is this true? And do you know? So I think that is, is basically true. The number might be a little different. I know it's 13 point something. I had thought it was 13.2, but they might have gotten one that's a little bit further. Just think about what that number means. It means the telescope captured light that has been traveling from where it was to where the telescope is for 13.5.8 billion years. I mean, Hubble is really a time machine. Everything that it brings down to us are pictures of what used to be out there because you know, even light has limits to how fast it goes. It's not instantaneous. So can you imagine uh, the picture of the distant galaxy is maybe already a billion years old. And so what does it look like today? Well, you'll never know unless we're uh, up close to it. 
But to me, that that's amazing. That's how Hubble can help us understand how the universe was created from the time of the Big Bang, which is right in about that 13.8 billion years, we believe, based on all the science that has been done. But there's questions that have Hubble's raised that we didn't even know we were going to have about the expansion of the universe. And uh, people are saying, well, you know, you would expect the universe would be kind of like when you're playing catch and you throw a ball up in the air, it goes up to a certain point, stops, and then comes back to you. You think the universe would kind of expand and then contract. Well, it turns out the universe is expanding and accelerating. So it's like I threw the ball up and it just took off and kept going. It, it's uh, amazing. And we don't understand how that happens. Uh, the scientists tell me that they think uh, when you, you add everything up, we can only ac account for about 6% of the matter that should be in the universe. And the rest of it is either dark energy or dark matter. And we don't really understand that. I'm like, wow, that's pretty amazing uh, what we don't know. But uh, it's an interesting thing to think about. Someone asks... Uh, when you get back from space, are you lighter than what you were when you left? So most people do lose weight on orbit, and I don't think it's because of being in space. Um, it's just because of the overhead of eating food. Most of our food comes in packages. You have a little scissor set that you will cut it open, or you put it on the, the uh, galley, which rehydrates the food, and then you can heat it up in the oven and then cut the top off so you can spoon the food out to eat. So it just takes a little bit of effort and getting enough calories in while you're working and doing everything is kind of a challenge at times. Uh, we flew a lot of instant breakfast on one of my flights to try and help people, you know, keep up, keep their energy up. What kind of, someone asked, what kind of food do you eat in space? Well, so there's dehydrated food, uh, things like uh, we have cornflakes sometimes for breakfast with dehydrated milk on them. So you can eat those, oatmeal, uh, scrambled eggs. Now, uh, the instruction said put three ounces of water in the scrambled eggs package. So I did that and I opened them up and they were kind of runny and I like my eggs a little firmer. So the next day, I said, okay, I'm only putting two ounces in, so I'll get a better, better egg, more like I like. So it happened. It made eggs more like I like. But what I found in space is when I went to spoon into them, little pieces of eggs started flying everywhere. And it was like, whoa, look out. And I had to go around catching all these pieces of egg that I had put in the cockpit uh, in the, on the shuttle. And I said, okay, I guess I better eat eggs according to the menu that they give us. Uh, my favorite food is probably the... Uh, uh, shrimp cocktail with a little spicy because when you go to space uh, in zero G, all the fluid that is sitting now in our lower extremities and being held down by gravity kind of floats up and your head gets kind of swollen and you feel a little bit like you've got a cold. And I always liked the spicy taste while I was on orbit of the shrimp cocktail sauce. Is, is, uh, Astronaut ice cream that you can buy in gift shops, is that really like the ice cream you have in space? I have to admit, no, they don't let us fly astronaut ice cream. I've only had that on the ground. <laughs> um, the question was asked, do you prefer life with gravity or without? Well, interesting. Basically, I have to say I prefer life with gravity because my family's here. I didn't get to take them with me in space. Now, if we could have a family and a job on orbit, it's pretty cool. I mean, I, I'm not sure I'd want to come back. Uh, but uh, given, you know, my family, I, I'd rather be on Earth with them than on orbit in zero G. Um, since you are the expert on space toilets, how does one work in space? <laughs> well, so there, there's the easy answer to that, and uh, that is uh, uh, to use a toilet in space, you just have to be careful where you put everything and make sure it all goes where it's supposed to. 
The space toilet actually has a, um, a airflow system, kind of like suction that pulls things down. However, um, aim is important. And we have a trainer uh, in Houston, which is a closed loop camera that films from the bottom of the WCS. So you can look on a camera and evaluate your ability to position everything in the right spot. Now I'm told it's a closed uh, loop system and that it doesn't get beamed out to anybody else. So uh, hopefully that was true. Uh, this question is from Michael. As space exploration expands to human travel to the moon and to Mars, will the International Space Station have a role in either mission? The International Space Station is really essential to our ability to travel long distances in space, like to Mars. Mars is going to take uh, astronauts about six months to get from Earth to Mars. So we need to make sure we know how to take care of people for six months at a time in space. Can you maintain your fitness so that when you take off from Earth and get to Mars, when you land, you can actually get out and walk around after six months of zero G? And the International Space Station has taught us how to do that with people living long terms on the, the space station. We know how to work out. We know how to protect people from radiation. We know how to provide systems that provide oxygen and scrub the carbon dioxide. And it's all being demonstrated and proven on the International Space Station. While at the same time, it does cutting edge research in a lot of different fields, uh, like in chemistry, biology, looking at how things grow, how crystals form, and provides all that insight to make life better on Earth and help us travel in space farther and safer. Okay, um, from Joe, what do you miss the most about being an active astronaut and what do you miss the least? Well, I'll, I'll tell you the thing I miss the most about being an active astronaut is having a T-38 to go flying in because I would just love to go jump back in the jet again and get airborne. And that that was the one thing. Uh, the reason I left NASA is due to my sitting height, I don't fit in the Soyuz spacecraft. So when the shuttle was retired, they said, uh, Scooter, you don't have a ride to orbit anymore. Uh, you're not we're not going to keep you as an active astronaut and you're not going to be able to fly the T-38 anymore. I said, okay, if I'm, I'm not flying at all, uh, I think I'm going to try my hand at industry and move on. So that's, that's why I left NASA when I did. Uh, but uh, so that's my favorite thing for uh, being an astronaut. Obviously flying in space is pretty good too, but I got to fly the T-38 a lot more than I got to fly on orbit. Um, and the least favorite is uh, the times when you really want to get assigned to a mission and they pick somebody else. And you got to learn how to deal with that disappointment because every astronaut doesn't get to go on every mission, uh, even though you might want to. And learning how to respond to that and deal with it um, was probably one of the harder things to do as an astronaut. Uh, what do you do to work out in space? So uh, working out in space is actually really important. The guys on space station work out for about two hours a day. On the shuttle, we didn't have to work out quite as much because we weren't gone that long, but we did have a bicycle, an ergometer that we would work out on. And uh, a few times you could actually uh, dial up the resistance and use it as a, sort of like lifting weights by pushing it that way. Although we were doing the, uh, the spacewalks on Hubble and we had a guy out at the end of the arm and they came down and they said, Scooter, you have to quit working out. I'm like, why? I'm, I'm, it's my break. I'm taking this. I said, well, what you're doing on the bike is making the arm wobble at the end while they're trying to repair the Hubble. So we need you to stop. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, oh, and on station now, they have something called FRED, which is... Uh, um, I don't remember what the F stands for, resistive exercise device. So it's kind of like a spring loaded weight set that you can do push, you know, bench presses with and do pull, pulls with and different things like that. So they, they work out on a treadmill too. 
to keep the aerobic system up because it's really easy to just float around in space. Your heart doesn't have to work much at all. Uh, but to keep your muscle mass up and keep your bones healthy, you need to do weightlifting to try and uh, keep that because otherwise the calcium leaks out of your bones and they become uh, less thick and less strong. And you don't want to have that happen for when you get to Mars to get out and go walking around on the surface. Okay, the last question I'm, oh, there's two questions. So uh, how long does it take or how long did it take to get to um, like the International Space Station or the telescope? So, uh, yeah, I should have probably covered that. So you're lying on your back waiting for the shuttle to launch and all of a sudden the solid rocket boosters go off and you, okay, we're on our way. Eight and a half minutes later is when Miko happens and you're in space, you get zero G. So I tell people it's the fastest way out of the parking lot when you're down at a launch is to be on the shuttle uh, rocketing into orbit. Now we could, because the shuttle needs to be reconfigured after you get to orbit, we actually rendezvous with the station or the Hubble on the third day. So you have about a half a day on launch, go to bed, get up, reconfigure the orbiter to get ready for rendezvous the next day. On our flight, we had to do an inspection of the vehicle using the robotic arm to go all around the shuttle and see how it was doing to make sure it was safe and hadn't been damaged. And then on day three, we, the next day we rendezvoused with Hubble, grabbed it and put it on the rotating turntable in the back. Um, not exactly certain what this, how long, how far is the longest you can cope on the spacecraft? I'm not sure what that, like how long can you stay on or, or what is the? Yeah, so uh, the nice thing about space station is they have those solar arrays, the big panels that allow uh, people to, um, have unlimited power. Shuttle didn't take solar arrays, it had fuel cells. And the fuel cells were driven by basically cans of oxygen and cans of hydrogen. You put that together in a fuel cell, you get electricity out and water. So we had plenty of water, uh, but when you ran out of oxygen and hydrogen, uh, you ran out of power and everything, you know, dialed down. So the longest we could stay on a shuttle mission was about 15 days without an extended uh, duration pallet on board. And uh, on my last mission, we got waved off for two days. So we were supposed to land on flight day 12. We didn't land until flight day 14. And we really couldn't have stayed up one more day uh, without running out of power and becoming a dead uh, satellite. Um, there's a question about um when you started and retired, you know, what your ages were, what is the, the typical uh, career of, length of a career of an astronaut? Well, uh, it varies. I mean, some people come fly once and then go back to doing something else. Uh, I flew four times like we commented on. I was there uh, a little over 15 years from 95 through 2010 and uh, that's probably about the average. Uh, you want to select astronauts when they've done enough so you can recognize whether or not they have all the abilities that you're looking for in space. So most astronauts average somewhere between say 32 and 38 years old is sort of the, the prime window. I was 35 right in the middle of that. And then I left when I turned 50 uh, just after my last mission. So, and I'd say, uh, a lot of the guys in my um, time frame flew three or four times and then left. There's a few folks who are still there who haven't left yet uh, doing things, uh, not from my astronaut class, but from the one after it, I think. So Stephanie Wilson hopes to be the first woman on uh, the moon. So I hope she is. And she came from the 1996 class. That's fantastic. Um, now you, you mentioned in your your current position, um, you are working on um, more yeah. space technology and things like that. Can you tell us a little bit, a little bit more about that? One of the things when I uh, made the decision to leave NASA after getting kicked out of the T-38 uh, was I wanted to look around at industry and figure out what my next thing was. And it, it was kind of a funny 
time for me in that my whole life, I had always known what the next thing I wanted to do was. You know, I wanted to be a pilot. Then I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Then I wanted to be a test pilot. Then I wanted to be an astronaut. Then I wanted to be an astronaut commander of a shuttle mission. And now at the end of that, I'm like, I don't know what I want to do next. So I talked to other astronauts who'd retired and uh, looked around at different companies like Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, and ended up ASRC Federal had actually provided some of the folks who supported my missions because they were based out of the Goddard Space Flight Center here in the D.C. area. And uh, I got to meet some of that leadership. And another astronaut told me, he said, hey, don't turn your nose up at smaller companies. There's a lot of opportunity out there. So I made the decision to join ASRC Federal in 2010. And I've been there, you know, it's coming up on uh, 11 years, I guess. And uh, uh, I've really enjoyed it. What we do is provide engineering support to NASA, to NOAA, and to the U.S. Space Force. So I have a crew of guys in Florida who are actually the assemblers of the Orion spacecraft vehicle. I have folks working contracts here at Goddard that are doing um, software engineering support work, helping design the ground stations for uh, weather satellites that are being built and turned out. Uh, people out in California who run the range, we just had a, an all hands tonight before I came on with you with those guys celebrating the success they've had operating the, uh, the NASA Armstrong ranges and managing their data. So. There's a lot of activity there. There's a lot of things that need to be done for NASA to be successful. So, you know, almost any career you can think of, there can be a NASA connection. Um, we just have another minute or two. So for our younger watchers, do you have any, uh, besides reading, obviously, we want them to keep doing that. Do you have any other words of wisdom for them? Well, I, I would just say, uh, keep in mind what my parents told me, because it's a, it's a good thing to do. You know, uh, work hard. And sometimes that means uh, keeping your eyes open and looking around, being exposed to as many things as you can, because as you do that, you'll find that one thing that really excites you, that you're thrilled out about. And when you find something that you're passionate about, it's easy to do your best because you like what you're doing. So work hard, uh, do your best and follow your dreams. You know, people will tell you no, but that's not the end of the story every time. There might be another way. There's always a chance. The, one, the only thing you can be sure of is if you give up, it won't happen. But if you keep trying, there's always a chance. And maybe your dream will evolve into something a little different uh, I understand, you know, that can happen and that works too. So do your best, work hard, don't give up. Um, we just had one comment for you. Um, again, thank you for your presentation and answering many questions that will inspire the next generation of astronauts. I just hope that one of the, the younger generation listening today when they get that mission to Mars and they're standing on that planet, we'll just uh, look up and say, hey, thanks, Scooter. I appreciated you coming and talking to me back in the day. So thanks everybody. Great seeing you all. Uh, enjoyed it very much. All right, thank you so much, Scott. Um, and again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to the Klein friends for, for helping us to be able to present this. Um, and I, was going to record the entire presentation. And of course I forgot to hit the record button until halfway <laughs> through. So we do have a lot of the presentation and we'll actually be able to put um, what we do have um, on YouTube. So um, we can come back and the Q and A is all there and the Q and A was fantastic. <laughs> so, so I appreciate that. Um, and, and again, have a wonderful evening. Thank you all, see you everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, Laura. <laughs> Bye, Gretchen. Bye.
See ya. You want to wave goodbye, honey? Yeah. It is.